Time to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon, and my name is Alita Williams, and I am the president of the Rotary Club of Chicago. I would like to convene our 5,684th meeting. And so right now, since we don't have anyone assigned for the thought of the day, I guess I'll give one. We're going into the holiday season, and I would just implore everyone to be kind to each other, to think about putting other people's care and need in front of our own, and just living by the four-way test and making sure that everything that we do is beneficial to all concerned and is fair to all concerned. And if we all think of that through the holidays and moving forward, we will have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season, number one. And number two, there's a wonderful sign-up list over on the desk. So when you put your name tags back today, our wonderful members, please sign up for one of the thoughts of the day so that I'm not blindsided and have to do this again, but no, I'm just kidding. Totally fun. <laughs> and so next, we are going to have a wonderful speaker today. We will do our best to get to all the questions in the Zoom. Please put them in the chat box if you have questions for the people in the room. Let's keep our, let's keep everyone's questions succinct and one question per person. We're not very good about that, but let's try it. <laughs> and then we will make sure that we get around the room. And with that, I would like to present Eric Kempel to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alita. So how many people in the room here today have either personally been affected by or have had a loved one who's been affected by cancer? Yeah, it's almost hard to imagine not having any hands up in the room, right? Um, and certainly in my own very limited and non-professional experience on the matter, um, from what I've seen from folks who have been impacted by, by cancer, uh, one of the, the, the best indicators of success seems to be how early you, you spot it, right? The folks that I know who, who weren't checking for things, who weren't going to the doctor, um, and then found out uh, that they did have cancer, it was often too late in, in the game to do anything about it. And so Dr. Kevin King is here with us today to, to talk to us a little bit about cancer and also how to look for those signs and how to make sure that we're on top of those things. So I think today's presentation is extremely important. Um, Dr. King serves as a radiation oncologist, uh, evaluating and treating patients with a variety of types and stages of cancer at the City of Hope Downtown Chicago Outpatient Clinic. Um, and he is a resident of downtown as well, so he's really working to, to sort of expand the, the knowledge uh, throughout the, the core of the city. Um, you can read a lot about uh, the doctor's uh, various accolades and specific uh, elements of cancer, which are uh, well beyond my area of expertise. But I do want to uh, share a few stories uh, from, his, from his bio about his, his journey. I found it interesting that he was inspired by his middle school friend's struggle with leukemia and even had his chest tattoos with the words, hope and faith. Um, we will uh, we'll not ask you to prove that uh, today. Um, he shadowed a radiation oncologist during medical school and fell in love with that specialty. He joined City of Hope because he saw an opportunity to de deliver a higher level of care in Chicago um, and really sort of help prioritize uh, speeding up that level of care. Uh, I know that, uh, as you say in your bio, you don't want people to have to live in limbo, trying to understand what they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to be doing. I think it's worth noting uh, that, in addition to his uh, medical school and training here in Chicago, he also served two years of service in Azerbaijan with the Peace Corps. You may know that Rotary and Peace Corps uh, also have a very strong relationship and a strong history. Uh, Dr. King is also a member of the American, uh, uh, excuse me, American Society of Radiation Oncology, American College of Radiation Oncology, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American College of Radiology, the Radiology Soli uh, Society of North America, and the Illinois State Radiologic Society, oh, and I forgot one, the Chicago Radiologic Society. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, well, I think Dr. King can talk 
better about this than I can. So please welcome Dr. King to the podium. All right, thank you for that warm introduction, Eric. Um, all right, how do I switch over? Perfect, here are my slides. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to come and speak here today. My name is Kevin King. I am a radiation oncologist currently working at City of Hope. I work downtown Chicago um, on the corner of Michigan and Illinois, so right by the Tribune Tower. Um, a little bit about myself. I, like Eric was saying, I was in the Peace Corps before going to medical school. So I served two years in Azerbaijan, which was an absolutely wonderful experience. Um, it is something that still kind of drives me today of wanting to be involved in the community and be invested in really making sure that, you know, just with everything going on in Chicago today with all sorts of different situations and even around the world, I really think that trying to be invested in your community and giving back and trying to just do as much goodwill as possible really, really makes a matter, makes a big difference even for really small issues. So it's one of the reasons why I like to come out, give talks like this, just be invested let people know just what the options are out there. Um, I apologize to some of the doctors who are in the crowd today. This is going to be a very basic presentation. If you're expecting all the new latest and greatest, it is not necessarily that, but we can always talk about that later. Um, so first up, just basics. What is cancer? You know, from a very, very basic sense of the whole thing, it's just one single cell having a mutation that makes it start growing. Once it starts growing, it could get into your vasculature, into the blood vessels, which then could go to other places throughout the body. That's what cancer is in the very simplest of terms. But in reality, cancer is much more complicated than that. Every single cancer is different. There's not one single same cancer. So when everyone says, how do we not have a cure for it? Because we're treating so many different types of cancer that are out there. This is something called um, the hallmarks of disease essentially for cancer. And each one of these things on this table go into playing what cancer actually is. Just to pick out a few, you know, it's able to avoid your immune system. It's able to draw different inflammation signals to protect itself, as well as inflammation signals to push other normal cells away. It's able to develop ways that have blood vessels grow to it to start feeding the cancer cell itself. It's figured out a way to just have nonstop division and keep dividing. All of these things are kind of what we are fighting against when we are in the fight against cancer. So it's a very complicated disease with many different options, and which is why we're looking at so many different areas of how to treat it. Within 2023, they say about 2 million people are going to be diagnosed with cancer. And as you can see, this is from the SEER database, which is an epidemiologic database that looks on cancer rates and trends. And within this, you can see that the sex linked cancers of breast and prostate cancer are the most common cancers that are going to happen in America, followed by lung and then colorectal cancer. But among those 2 million people, about 600,000 people are going to die from cancer this year. And while breast and prostate were doing a great job of catching it, finding um, treatments for it, it's these lung and these colon cancer patients that are still have, you know, not the outcomes that we would be necessarily hoping for, which again is just another reason why I'm here today to talk about what we can do to help with some of the screening and how everyone can live just a healthier lifestyle. I'm also going to briefly address some of the most recent updates in cancer and kind of where we are as a field, what's exciting, what we're looking forward to, just so everyone can kind of get some knowledge around it. So I like to say from a cancer perspective, there's kind of three main groups that are associated with a cancer diagnosis. There are the surgical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, and the medical oncologists. All of us are oncology doctors, all of us are cancer doctors, and we work together to try and figure out what's the best way. One of the ways I like to describe it is that a surgical oncologist is almost like the gardener coming in and pulling out a weed. A radiation oncologist like myself is gonna come in with weed killer and kind of spray the area down just to make sure there's no more weeds there. And then you have your medical oncology team that's gonna put fertilizer over the entire ground and make sure that we have a whole new system and there's no more cancer cells kind of lurking around. But today, um, when you can divide up even further, surgery and radiation are both very targeted treatments, meaning it doesn't go throughout the entire body. 
Then on the other side of things, I have what I like to call just your systemic therapies. This would include things like chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted agents, and hormone therapy. The two that I'm going to be briefly focusing on today, the first one um, is going to be immunotherapy, just with everything that's very exciting and happening within this field, as well as radiation, some of the updates in my fields, uh, particularly for you to learn more about. So I don't know if you guys saw this. This came out last year. This was a trial for colorectal cancer patients who received this immunotherapy drug up front. It was a very small trial. Um, they say 18 people on this, but there was actually 12 people that went through the trial. And amongst the 12, all of them had a complete response using this immunotherapy. In the world of colorectal, how the kind of current treatment standard is, is to do chemo, chemotherapy and radiation together, followed by more chemotherapy, followed by a surgical resection that can often leave a patient having some sort of ostomy with a bag um, or a pretty complicated surgery. So the fact that we're seeing a complete response in these 12 patients was super, super exciting for us. This was the actual trial. Now, when you actually break it down, it's a little more complicated than that. The patients that were in this trial specifically had a, a genetic change called a mismatch repair deficient disease, which unfortunately is only about 10% of these colorectal cancer patients. So it's a small proportion of a large group that had a great response. Most recently, this was a trial that was actually just published earlier this month, kind of looking at using this immunotherapy for patients with this mismatch repair deficiency and it wasn't just colorectal patients, it was a bunch of them with a high proportion of endometrial cancer in there as well. But unfortunately, they only found that about 44% did have a complete response. But of those who did, it lasted about 78% lasted for longer than a year of how long we see a durability effect, which is still very exciting. It might not be everything that we hoped it would be from initially, but it's something that gives all of us a very, you know, hope for the future. Similarly with immunotherapy, this is a trial called the Pacific Trial looking at patients with advanced lung cancer. And what they found is that by adding immunotherapy onto the end of a standard definitive chemo and radiation treatment for lung cancer, they were able to improve the overall survival at five years by 10%. Now I know that might not seem like the craziest thing in the world, but in our field to get an overall survival benefit on something of 10% is huge for us. So we are very excited. We usually don't see these types of numbers very often. So when this came out, it's very much a game changer. And now a lot of the trials out there are looking, how do we incorporate immunotherapy earlier? How do we in encourage the body to fight off the cancer on its own and get the immune system really up and running to make a difference? Moving over to the radiation side of things. Now, when I say I'm a radiation oncologist, this is the reaction most people will give me. You know, they just hear caution, they hear nuclear warfare, explosions. They think you're gonna be the fish from the Simpsons getting genetic mutations, or we're gonna give you superpowers, make you turn into the Hulk. This is not true. Um, radiation is very, very focused. And actually radiation is just something that will go in and usually hit some sort of water, water molecule close by to a tumor cell. From there, that water molecule goes off and puts a little nick into the tumor DNA that's going to kill the tumor cell when it goes to divide later. The radiation is very focused. It doesn't go throughout the entire body. You're not radioactive. None of these things are true. It's really just another way to deliver a targeted uh, therapy for cancer treatment. Um, as we continue on, one of the major advancements within radiation specifically is how we look at what it means to have metastatic disease. So metastatic disease means that the cancer has moved to other parts of your body. And in the past, we used to say, okay, a guy walks in with prostate cancer, that prostate cancer they find out is in one of the lymph nodes. From there, the thought process was that lymph node then, since it's already kind of thought to be outside of the prostate, it's moved to another location, it could be in the bones, it could be another bone lesion, it could go to the lungs, liver, another bone, liver, and it was kind of just viewed as this all or none process, and we say, hey, you know, it's just a role of systemic therapy, there's nothing really else we can do here. But as we've seen over the past few years, there's this idea of oligometastatic disease, meaning a few different areas of where they might be progressing or where they might the cancer might have moved to. So the idea is that if you have the prostate cancer, 
it goes to the lymph nodes and that lymph node initially goes to maybe a bone mat. So this is when the patient presents. This is where they're saying they have metastatic disease. Before we used to say all or none and we didn't really know where the cancer was. So we just go with systemic therapy and we treat them that way. But what we're actually finding is that maybe that bone lesion gives off one bone lesion. That bone lesion leads to a second uh, lung lesion and so on and so forth. Maybe that lung lesion goes to another bone lesion. And the idea is that if we were able to start earlier and specifically target that first bone lesion, we can start treating these cases that were previously considered to be unresectable, un incurable, having a survival benefit and a progression-free survival benefit by treating almost definitively to both the primary and some of these other locations. So this is one of the large trials that kind of backs this. It's called the Sabre Comet trial. And essentially it does just that. It's for patients who have metastatic disease, who have at, uh, up to five different lesions throughout their body. At that time, they deliver radiation and chemotherapy and surgery to the primary location, as well as to the areas of metastatic disease. And as you can see in the graphs here, there was both a survival benefit and a progression-free survival benefit for both of these uh, treatment options. Another thing that was very exciting within my field is talking about shorter treatment courses. So traditionally, radiation is delivered once a day, um, every day, Monday through Friday, and it used to be over seven or eight weeks. So you would get these patients there every day. The treatment is very short. It's only about 15 minutes, but it's such a time commitment and people are really taking a long time. We did that because the idea was to spare the normal tissue around kind of the area that we're treating to reduce the toxicities. But what we're finding is that we can give a larger dose of radiation in fewer treatments. So something before that used to take, you know, seven or eight weeks every single day is now only taking a total of five treatments with very minimal toxicity. So this is something for uh, prostate cancer specifically. It's not necessarily all prostate cancer. So again, any sort of questions, I do recommend talking to your doctor about the specifics on these things. But this is a study that looked at what we call SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy and looked at just doing these five treatments for some of the earlier lower risk prostate cancer and showing very similar uh, both uh, the incidence of having some sort of recurrence uh, as well as the incidence of having some sort of distant metastases, which ultimately means that for these prostate cancers that take a very long time to slowly grow, we can do a definitive treatment upfront, minimally invasive, five treatments, and you're treated and cured. Likewise, for lung cancer, we have the same idea. Something before that used to have to have surgery for a lung nodule that's being monitored over all these years. Is it growing? Is it not? We can now treat these with one single fraction of radiation. The patients do excellent. There's very, very minimal toxicity, if anything at all. And essentially, we have the same cure rates as surgical resection is without the surgery, without the recovery time, without all of these things. So very exciting about different ways within the field that we continue to advance we continue to look forward in different treatment options for patients. So that's kind of the updates. Now we're talking more about the prevention and what we can do to actually fight off cancer and make sure we stay up to date on our screenings. So I'm gonna go through some of these 10 tips. Um, the first one is just eating healthy. You know, there are a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are studies that have had large kind of retrospective reviews that look at the association of some of these things, not necessarily saying this is exact, this causes this, this is how it works, but there is some sort of connection that we're still learning about. So the first one is lots of fruits and vegetables. They found that a, a diet consisting of a lot of red meat has been associated with colorectal cancer. Getting lots of exercise can help for many different cancers all across the board, making sure you're staying physically fit and active. So they recommend at least 30 minutes a day of some sort of uh, physical fitness. To not smoke, this is probably the biggest one on there. If there are still smokers in this room, please consider your friends and family to stop smoking. Whether it's head and neck cancer, lung cancer, bladder cancer, some gyne cancers, it has such a connection to different cancers out there. And they actually, if you think about your lung function, the day that you stop smoking, if your lung function keeps declining while smoking, the day that you stop, it actually starts leveling out. So even if you can get your friends and family to stop that day, it's so, so, so important. 
Using SPF, every dermatologist I know wears a daily SPF, as do I. It's very important to prevent skin cancers, um, as well as getting immunized. So most recently, the HPV vaccine was approved up to people age 45, um, something to get that can prevent both gyne um, and GI cancers, as well as a lot of head and neck cancers are associated with the HPV virus. Practicing safe sex, again, uh, will be associated with reducing that HPV virus transmission having regular exams um, to make sure you get checked often and early, taking breaks to just kind of reduce the stress in your life. Um, and a lot of the stress leads to kind of bad behaviors, including smoking, including overeating. So really making sure to take time for yourself and uh, focusing on yourself throughout the, all of this. Avoiding sugary drinks. I know everyone probably saw most recently drinking, you know, Diet Coke has been associated with risks of cancer. That study was saying that if you drink maybe 12 cans a day, there might be. So I'm not saying don't stop just now, but you know, all these major headlines, you got to break down and really look at the studies, really look at the details about what this actually looks like. So, you know, Diet Coke, while some of these sugars and sweeteners might have an effect, we are also saying that like everything in moderation. Um, and then finally, just staying hydrated, making sure your body is functioning really to its max capacity and working well. When it comes to the actual screening that we have available, this is kind of the current screening recommendations by age. So you can see that <clears throat> this is specifically for women. When they're aged in their 20s to uh, 40s, essentially it's getting cervical cancer screening, and then they recommend doing self breast exams. From there, from your 40s to 50s, you're gonna start incorporating things like your colon cancer screening, as well as getting breast cancer screening, because we're finding that we're diagnosing more women at a younger age with breast cancer. And whether that's because more women are getting screened or we're not totally sure, but that's kind of the trend that we're getting right now. Similarly, when you get to the 50s to about 65, we are continuing with all of these, but now we're gonna start adding in lung cancer screening if you have a history of smoking um, with pretty specifics in there, but getting a low dose CT annually for a history of smoking can help catch these nodules early. And say you, again, maybe aren't the best surgical candidate for something like that, radiation like I just showed you is a single fraction if you catch it early enough, essentially no toxicity for something like this and patients do very well to treat it. And then finally 65 up, this is when you're gonna start backing off on things, just kind of making sure, hey, we're healthy, you know, things are going okay. And again, a conversation with your doctor about that, but not really adding anything new in. For men, very similar. Um, 20s to 40s, not really anything major to be watching out for other than skin cancer that we wanna be getting a check with your doctor just to make sure any sort of sus suspicious moles or lesions could be something that we could act on. But once we start to get in 40s and 50s, now we're talking again about colon cancer screening and as well as prostate cancer screening. You can get a PSA value, um, which is a lab value in your blood that can detect prostate cancer early. And this is usually what triggers the urologist to do some sort of biopsy to start you on some sort of treatment. Now, prostate cancer can be a very, very slow growing disease. So, you know, there is the risk and benefit of having these blood tests getting checked, as well as just making sure that um, you might getting biopsied over biopsied is a risk. But in my mind, with my patients, I'd rather them be safe than sorry. So if it makes means getting a biopsy for something, I like to lean towards that way. But at the end of the day, it's a conversation between you and your doctor and just making sure you feel the most comfortable about what is uh, being recommended. Continuing on from 50s to 60s, again, we're talking about lung cancer, um, again, with those low dose CT screenings and colon cancer screening. And then those will continue on to 65 plus as we start backing off as we continue to age about what different options are out there. The last thing I do wanna say throughout all of cancer treatment, I mean, I saw everyone's hand kind of go up here because everyone knows someone who has cancer, who has gone through cancer. Maybe they've had a cancer themselves. And I wanna say the power of community is just so important, which is another reason why I wanted to come here today, really be invested in the community, really make sure that people know that they have supported, they feel supported, there are options out there. Um, and just to say that like, it really matters a lot to check in on your friends and family who are going through cancer treatments and to let them know that they're not alone because this is a disease that we're all gonna to fight together. It's not just one person going through this and unfortunately it affects all of us. Um, so with that, I do wanna say thank Thank you, and I am open to any questions. Um, 
I appreciate the time. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, we as a club have been in touch here in town with Women Angels. So on your last point, this is a, uh, a team effort. I think we as a club are aware of that. But when it comes to fighting the disease at large as a society, what, 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 what can we as non-patients do? Is this be the support of the American Cancer Society? If, if you had 10 bucks, where would you put them? Uh, the first thing I would do is get people to stop smoking, you know, done check. I did that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the big one. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what we see are these smoking related cancers. Um, so then honestly, just following a lot of the recommendations, there are some amazing, amazing groups in Chicago, like the Emmerman Angels, um, there's House of Hope, which gives like free housing for patients undergoing cancer treatment. There's the American Cancer Society that has branches for Relay for Life, all sorts of things. They are amazing. I highly recommend you getting involved with them if that's an outlet that you're looking to be, um, looking to have, because they are always asking for volunteers. But I think ultimately it's just making sure to focus on yourself and say your friends and your family around and, you know, be that annoying son and ask your mom and say, hey, when was your last breast cancer screening? When was your last mammogram? Like, let's talk about these issues that maybe people feel uncomfortable talking about, but this is what ends up saving lives. I can't tell you how many patients I see that maybe they had a mammogram when they turned 50 and then you know they didn't think of anything of it and they just kind of let it go and even though there was some concerning sights on it and then three years later they present with widely metastatic disease that is now incurable when for a lot of breast cancer out there these are curable things that we're looking at we're looking at actually giving a cure for the rest of their lives it's just not every cancer yet we're there for. So really making sure you take care of yourselves and the people around you is probably honestly the best way that I can say how we fight this as a community as a whole. Hi, thank you again for being here. Of course. So um, I'm a professor at a university and I teach a health class. Nice. And so I'm curious uh, because vaping has started much younger in the schools and then with the legalization of marijuana. I was just curious, I'm sure they're all shades of terrible, but is, is one worse than the other? I know they're all bad. Yeah, great question. And there isn't a definitive answer just yet. We do know that smoking is worse than vaping, so to speak, if there is nicotine, in the vaping system um obviously that's going to have health effects with itself if i had to choose i would choose vaping over smoking we just don't know the full impact that vaping necessarily has just yet because we need to follow these people who are vaping for long periods of time and see what how many people are getting diagnosed with cancer who have this history the only studies that have done so far are saying that if you are vaping, it is slightly healthier than the smoking, but at the end of the day, it's still not recommended, something tech to do. So that's my getting around the answer. I don't have a total answer yet. It's not great, but we don't have the data necessarily just yet. Marijuana, so again, if you're smoking marijuana, it comes with the same health effects that smoking a cigarette would because it's just the smoke carcinogens that are affecting um, your lungs that are going to lead to cancer. So that's going to be the same. We, again, don't necessarily know when it comes down to vaping marijuana or doing an edible about totally what this major health effects are because it's been blocked from a lot of research up until recently. So now a lot of trials are starting to incorporate marijuana and what the health effects look like, and hopefully we'll have some good data on that soon. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, my name is Susan Prattis. I'm a member of Rotary One. And I've got two questions. At one point, uh, the group that was experiencing among the highest rates of cancer were women who didn't have any history of smoking. And it was lung cancers that they were getting. Have we made any progress in terms of figuring out why that's happening? And the second question, I'm also a laboratory animal veterinarian and a mm -hmm. private practitioner, and so I know an awful lot about different models of cancer. And when I trained, we used to put our pets on the back of golf carts and head down to the University of Pennsylvania Med School and do all of our radiation down there. 
Mm -hmm. Now we have more facilities for pets. Are you seeing any movement in your professional circles towards One Health types of approaches to cancer? Um, great questions. Uh, so I'll start by saying the incidence of lung cancer within women who are non-smokers. Um, we are finding that there are a lot of genetic mutations that are associated with those people. And what we're able to do, one of the options up there was not immunotherapy, but a targeted therapy that's going to look at these specific mutations. So there's something called an EGFR mutation for these lung cancer patients that before was almost considered a death sentence if you did have that mutation. But now we're finding that these patients have much, much better survival with this. And these are people that um, one, of, one of my patients in the past, you know, she is a huge advocate for getting these genetic screens when you do get cancer to make it a much more personalized care because we're able to move in a direction look, looking at specifically which genes are mutated, which ones are methylated, which ones have that problem in them, and we can specifically give a treatment that targets that specific mutation, which is very exciting. Um, the second thing is when it comes to different treatment techniques, I have only heard rumors of seeing some of the large animals being treated. Um, I trained at Rush, so I we have pictures all around of like jaguars with their mouths open with like under sedation, undergoing radiation for uh, oral cavity cancer, um, which always just blows my mind. It is super interesting. I think that there are a lot of opportunities out there and a lot of very dedicated people within that field who do a lot of the work there. Um, so I personally am not seeing a lot of animals coming through and seeing that sphere, but you know, never say never. So, <laughs> yep. I want to second the need for genetic testing and that type of thing, which is run in my own family. And I have uh, MSH, MSH6 Lynch syndrome, which I've gotten mm. from the paternal side of my family. So, I, just as a precautionary, I undergo the trifecta, the colorectal, and the whole bit. Uh, every other year. Fortunately, nothing's been found and so forth. That's great. But uh, I have done it at the earlier recommended age than, than they say you should. And I'd rather go through a, a tiny bit of unpleasantness than find out the hard way and stick your head in the sand like some of my family members chose to do. Yeah, that's excellent. I, I... You know, these genetic mutations, we've really moved into a world of personalized medicine. And it's not just, oh, you have breast cancer, here's here's what we do. Now it's, okay, let's actually get your genes. Let's, let's see the level of mutation. Because before, you know, we used to give chemotherapy to everyone. Now it's like, okay, even though you have a large tumor, even though you have maybe one lymph node, what is your oncotype? What is the genetic score of this cancer? How likely is it to move out? Do we need to be giving chemotherapy? Let's try and figure out ways to back off on the treatments to make them not as intense so patients can get through them, it's easier for them, um, and everyone has better outcomes that way. So I strongly encourage genetic testing for a lot of these patients as well. No. Okay. All right. Well, Beth, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you. So with that, I want to thank you for coming today. We have a wonderful Aww, mug for you thank to you. have. And some cookies from Al's Cookie Mix. Al, Alvin Green started a cookie company for his son and his friends that are autistic. And so as they grow out of the CPS system, you know, they just grow out and they just let them go. So he started a cookie company so that they could have a job when okay. they grow out the system. So awesome. please enjoy the well, cookie. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And so with that, we want to welcome our guests. So any visiting Rotarians in the room, if you would like to stand up and introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a member of the Club of Suresina in Italy, near Milan. Um, I come here every day, every year for, for work because we have a big congress here in radiology. <laughs> the, the speaker is a member of the Nord, Nord Society of Radiology in North America. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you and uh, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi there, my name is Valerie Steppel. I'm from the Rotary Club of Pittsburgh. Um, I just moved to Chicago like 25 days ago. Um, and the Rotary Club in Pittsburgh was some of my favorite people in the city. So I thought I would come to Chicago and see what it's about. Thank you. And then we have some guests in the room. Hi, I'm Sandra. Oh. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm here with Marco, and um, he wanted me to be with him because he was excited. It, it's our third time here, and finally was able to join you. So, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. My name is Rachel Mariani. I'm a longtime friend of Sarah and Gunnar, and it's an, an honor to be here with you all today. Hi, Rob Galamaga, also very longtime friends of uh, Gunnar and Sarah, and Rachel and I, uh, husband and wife, uh, both physicians, and we practiced a long time here in the Chicago area. Coincidentally, I'm at the City of Hope, uh, a sister site in, uh, in Arizona, and uh, just wonderful to come out and, and meet you all and engage in an important topic. Appreciate the work that you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any guests online who would like to unmute themselves and introduce themselves? Nope. Yeah, hello to everybody from Germany. My name is Hans Jochen Dupree. I'm from the Rotary Club Hannover Leibniz. And I'm happy to be with you again, uh, even by Zoom. Alita, I've met you already. And uh, warm regards to to Eric and uh, Timo and to everybody of you. It's a great evening, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. OK, so I think that's all of our guests. And so with that, if you would love to be a part of our wonderful group, we would love to have you. Please, you can go to the website to find out more about membership and being a part of our group. And we have tons of upcoming meetings. Our holiday party is on Tuesday next week. So we would love to have everyone come out and enjoy a great time at Cafe Chow on Madison and Sangamon on the, in the South Loop. So we look forward to celebrating the holidays with you all. And Timo. Good afternoon. So when I retired from this wonderful um, uh, office of president of this fine club, I thought I was done. <laughs> I was mistaken. <laughs> Very much so. Um, the second I tried to walk out the door, Alida immediately put her claws on my back. So, now you got one more job. And as you meet. <laughs> you just reminded me of that job. Anyway, as the um, immediate past president, I have the honor and privilege to uh, chair the nominating committee. And uh, first and foremost, I want to say we had received a ton of interest in candidates for the director and officer positions. Really great people, engaged members here. Um, and uh, it was a long and thoughtful process, I thought. I want to thank Eric. Pancho, where you saw, but yes, Pancho somewhere here. Uh, Pancho uh, West, uh, Westerfield and Mark Smith for joining me in this committee. And I'm glad to present our slate that we'd like to recommend uh, to the club. So as present nominee, it would be Shada Calderwood. Then as secretary, uh, Robert Harney is going to continue. As new treasurer, it would be Stephen Weimuller. And as the uh, three directors at large, we Nancy Kalkbrenner, Alexander Gordon, and our very own Brian Kaur here to the left. So that is the slate. I want to thank again the my 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 committee members. Thank you very much. And with that, um, I will now ask for any nominations for any position on the slate if any other nominees would like to nominate themselves. And with that, we will move on. So Sarah. So right now we have Cornerstone and we do every Wednesday. We had a great turnout. You can start coming up. We had a great turnout last week for Thanksgiving. So I want to thank everyone who came out. And Sarah can tell you about our scholarship. Okay, well, good afternoon. 
Uh, just uh, kind of the same announcements that I made last week, um, but this time it's a little bit more pertinent because November 30th is coming. Is it, is it today? It's not today. Okay, <laughs> it's a couple of days tomorrow. Anyway, it's coming. So our college scholarship is uh, due on, on November 30th. So we have several who have already applied, but they can still get it in. So if you know anybody who is attending college in the city proper of Chicago, they can apply for our scholarship from the Community Service Committee. Um, we're uh, focusing really on those who have performed service. So if you know anyone who does a lot of volunteer work and attends college in, in the city of Chicago, please get on the phone right now because November 30th is sometime in the near future. <laughs> Secondly, we have our community service committee holiday event with the Union Lean Boys and Girls Club. So this is on December 19th from four till six. The address is there, um, but just to sort of orient you, it's um, on 19th Street, just west of Damon. So we have, uh, at uh, last I heard, about 75 kindergarten through second graders coming to this event. I know, right? <laughs> I say that in bold letters. So we need volunteers. And uh, they'll be doing some crafts, and we're giving them a book, and the Union League, uh, the Boys and Girls Club will provide a Santa. We'll have some snacks. Alita's going to help us with that. So we definitely, I almost said desperately, I was going to say definitely, but I think I'm going to say desperately. <laughs> we desperately need volunteers to come out on that day. Um, it'll be a good time. There's just a lot of littles and a lot of littles is a lot to handle. So uh, there is a registration link in the gyrator. Thank you, Sarah. Um, another announcement, Shelterbox. So Shelterbox is an organization that started within Rotary and has now grown to its own organization that's very still tied with Rotary. They go to disaster locations and help give shelter and basic needs that people need to survive while they go through and can rebuild their lives in, in those areas. So if you are interested in Shelterbox or just want to go to Vegas and say you want a Shelterbox, they're having a conference December 1st through the 3rd in Las Vegas to go over what they do and to get more people involved. And you want to donate to the Rotary Foundation. The Rotary Foundation and the Rotary One Foundation is how we do the wonderful things that we do in the community and across the world. And so we would implore everyone to please make sure that you donate especially our members that's what these lovely little piggy banks in the middle of the tables are for if you would like to give some spare change spare dollars and a nice check and <laughs> and put it in this in the piggy banks we would greatly appreciate it and we have a wonderful app called the ignite app for all of our members that helps us to be able to take pictures at events um, register for events, pay your bill, and wonderful people, when they say they're interested in joining Rotary, you can send them an application quickly right through your phone without even thinking hard about it. So that's a great thing. This is the QR code for our gyrator. If you have not received it, if you would like to be on the list for the gyrator and you are not, you can see Sarah in, over there and she'll take care of that for you. And we have wonderful committee meetings coming up. Our DEI committee meeting is today at 5.30. Um, we have the community service on December 7th, the membership committee on December 12th, and our PR and marketing committee December 21st. The international service committee meeting is canceled for this Wednesday. And then our wonderful upcoming programming, our roundtable every Friday that we have here at the Union League Club, our wonderful holiday celebration, our RE set about, we have the Cook County Clerk, Karen Yarbrough, coming in to speak to us on December 12th. And then we have our annual meeting on December 19th. So I need all my members to come on out December 19th for the annual meeting so we can give you the state of the club and where we are and do some vote on stuff, I think. I'm not sure. No, I'm just kidding. No, just to have the state of the club and where we are and changes and all types of things that are happening in the club. And as we always say, if for whatever reason you're not going to be able to make the lunch, then please let us know so that we can better manage costs and not waste food. And with that, we are going to do the four-way test. So if everyone could please stand. 
So we can do the four way test of the things we think, say, or do. Number one. Number two. Number three. And number four. And what we like to say, number five, will it be fun? Thank you. And with that, I adjourn the meeting.